Socrates gives his speech to the young disciple, named Phaedrus. Love is a kind of desire, and when we chase after it, it becomes all-consuming. If it is a desire for food that overpowers a person's reasoning, it is gluttony. While if it is a desire for drink, they are an alcoholic. The man becomes a slave to pleasure, and he'll go so far as to trick his lover to abandon his family, keep them from their duties of studying or exercising, all to be focused on serving the man. The man loves his partner the same way Wolves love sheep. Concluding, it follows necessarily that he'd be giving himself to a man who is deceitful, irritable, jealous, disgusting, harmful to his property, and absolutely devastating to his soul. But after giving his passionate speech, he begins to cross the river back to the city, and he stops. Something inside Socrates stops him. He says, The familiar divine sign came to me which, whenever it occurs, holds me back from something I am about to do. This is a literary device Plato uses called the daimon, or divine being, supposedly stopping Socrates whenever he is about to make a mistake. Phaedrus himself gets shocked, because there seemed to be nothing wrong with what he heard. How could that be? Well, Socrates replies, it was foolish, and close to being impious. What could be more horrible than that? So Socrates recants, and begins to argue the virtue of love in what is called his grand speech, for the virtue love offers, and both agree it was the best speech they had heard. That's to say, it was better than Lysias even a local orator famous for his power to argue both sides of any issue. Lysias was famous for making important points feel trivial, pedantic issues grand, while remaining persuasive with only the fewest words or carrying speeches on forever. In fact, Phaedrus had written down word for word one of Lysias' grand speeches where he too argued against love. But again, both Socrates and Phaedrus agree Lysias rang silent. Only Socrates' grand speech, and only his first, had merit. Socrates now begins to try and explain with an example. Imagine there is a self-proclaimed doctor traveling door to door, advertising that she can raise body temperature up and down on command, or stop vomiting, or cause vomiting, or nearly any other thinkable bodily alteration. However, when that same person is put to the question, when is it best to do those type of things? When should you change the temperature or cause them to vomit? The same person says she doesn't know, only how to change the patient's bodily condition. And here, both agree this person isn't a doctor. And it helps to show the distinction between two types of speech makers. There is an individual who practices rhetoric, and there is an individual who knows the dialectic. The rhetoric master represents a self-proclaimed doctor who is fully capable of affecting an individual's soul, but is ignorant when and why any of the treatments should be applied. The dialectic, on the other hand, corresponds with the fully realized doctor who knows how to affect the soul and also knows when the treatments should be applied. But Phaedra suggests, it is not necessary for the intending orator to learn what is really just, but only what will seem just to the crowd who will act as judges, for that is what persuasion proceeds from. Here Socrates pushes back. If he nor his audience had ever seen a horse, it would be possible to point at a donkey and call it a horse. He would praise it as the tame animal with long ears, with value both at home and in military service. The problem is, the speechmaker cannot say she has made a sound argument. 
without knowing intricate distinctions oneself, the orator can confuse themselves. Now, in real life, to know the difference between a horse and a donkey is much easier. But when dealing with abstract abstractions, like justice or good, the class of objects have an ambiguous form. If you ask two people what those two things mean, justice or good, they would probably give you two different definitions. In fact, if you asked a thousand people, you'd probably have a thousand different definitions. So when debate concerns these ambiguous concepts, where their object is not clearly defined, Socrates finds these are the cases when it is easiest to be deceived. Lysias' speech was bad because it made no attempt to define the subject, making his speech the same as something called an epigram. This is to say, he never clearly defines any of the premises he seeks to make a conclusion for. To give an example, Socrates gives an epigram. A maid of bronze am I, on Midas to my lie, as long as water flows and trees grow tall, shielding the grave where many come to cry. That Midas rests here, I say to one and all. Any of these lines may be swapped with the other without losing meaning. Some artistic flair might be lost, but the meaning stays the same. And in that sense, Lycia's speech was just a fancy iteration of the epigram. His rhetoric strategy started with the conclusion, saying love is bad because it is bad. And that's precisely the distinction Socrates finds between his speeches and also why the speech changes between the first and second. His definition for love changes from what's called its left-handed sense to its right-handed sense. Owing to the earlier point, deception is likelier to occur when the subject is amorphous. These were two representations of the same object. In both speeches, love is described as a type of madness affecting the soul, but the distinction becomes the type of madness that love should be. The first characterizes the vices. Madness as a categorical bad, causing jealousy and hurting the lover. That can happen. But alternatively, the second speech exalts the virtues as a particular type of soul leading towards recognizing divine beauty. It's abstract, but in both cases we may recognize the speeches as a type of pure philosophy because they clearly define their starting points instead of making an epigram the way Lysias did. Now here we should note, Plato is taking a strong metaphysical stance by arguing objects like justice and good have their own independent existence. Now to that extent, my definition of pure philosophy in this video is going to change. I only want to define it as a type of self-knowledge the way that we think of our ideas, experiences, and emotions. As long as you're able to represent those accurately, you're gonna be able to practice pure philosophy. That also means Socrates' earlier arguments were both examples of accurate pure philosophy. He argued both sides of the same issue and reached valid conclusions in both. Isn't that problematic? It appears like something might be broken in the practice. The problem here are phenomenon, which escape a word's target. For instance, try describing the color red to someone born blind, or harmony to someone who is born deaf. The limit is obvious with our visual senses. But then, try describing what it's like to lose a loved one to someone who has never suffered that injury. When we try to over-rationalize these difficult-to-define issues, we will always fail. This is why Socrates stopped himself in the river. Not because he was wrong in his first speech, but because it failed to evoke the weight and true nature of love. Here, a poet named Audre Lorde offers valuable insight. She finds poetry and art will always have superior rhetorical power to pure philosophy. She writes, 
I speak here of poetry as a revelatory distillation of experience, not the sterile wordplay that too often the White Fathers distorted the word poetry to mean. Here, poetry could be synonymous with nearly any form of art. Take Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. At one time, it's a picture of the skyline, while at the same time representing the feelings he had. Now, scientists have found the stars correspond to real, astronomically correct locations in the night sky. And the buildings are the buildings outside saint Remy from outside his window. Clearly, what is not part of the real world is the way it has been put onto the canvas. The painting does not represent the way the night sky looked, instead, how it felt. Take Pablo Picasso. When he was young, he learned to paint realistically and draw portraits in intricate, lifelike detail. But he's most famous for his later works. The supposed childlike cubism was done during his 30s, and deeply abstract drawings define his career. In the same way Audre Lorde criticizes the White Fathers who practice sterile wordplay, these painters recognize the limits of painting ultra-realistic renderings. Poetry and art do not gain their identity from the technical flourishes, but truly the ability to transfer emotions. A pure philosophy has been defined to be the thing which clearly defines its premises and attempts to make a valid argument based on its starting point. Alternatively, poetry has been characterized as the thing which evokes starting points in themselves. If superior rhetoric is the faculty with the strongest capacity to influence other people, then the two cannot be separated. Both serve a function the other cannot. Calling back to the Phaedrus analytical claim, people are persuaded by what they are persuaded by. Given there are a multitude of distinct attitudes and emotions people carry, the arguer can convince the audience if they are able to know those attitudes. The speechmaker can create a clear definition, tailored to whichever attitude that individual has, just like with the horse and donkey. However, the arguer may run against a wall if the starting point is blasphemous in itself. This is what happened to Socrates when he stopped himself from crossing the river and before he began the second speech. Earlier, I had stopped short to describe that second speech, but in his new description for love, he uses an analogy. The soul recognizes love from glimpses into heaven. The true nature of love is divine and unarticulatable, and when lovers are drawn together, they are recognizing the resemblance to the true character they felt. He writes, love comes from the place beyond heaven. None of our earthly poets has ever sung or ever will sing its praises enough. What is in this place is without color and without shape and without solidity, a being that really is what it is, the subject of all true knowledge, visible only to intelligence. Although this does suggest some true universal object, the sentiment can be better understood as Socrates using literary strategy to show his audience what love feels like rather than tell his audience what it is. The practical takeaway for this argument is not that our souls literally saw above into the heavens and have love's true character, but a poetic approach is required to represent its true character. This rings in unison with Lord's strong stance for poetry. She finds it is uniquely able to distill feelings and emotion. Appealing to emotion is not disparaging to black poets for not being rational. Rather, it is a strength, since it is the only way self-knowledge and experiences can be expressed. For these reasons, poetry and art have a power pure philosophy doesn't. They can communicate emotions and experiences. They're never going to be the same thing, but it'll be like glimpses into heaven, the way Socrates describes we see love, and we're recognizing that same image. Now, it has a weird subject matter, 
And on top of that, talking about love, one of the biggest cliches in any type of literature and art. So putting that aside, I think that we can take a lot of these points to heart about rhetoric, debate, and the limits of pure philosophy. There's going to be a point where we need to actually evoke a type of emotion in itself that words just aren't going to be able to do. We have to define the subject matter in order to discuss it. So if we can't get on the same page before doing that discussion, then we're going to have a problem. The conclusions we have are going to be from completely different variables. So for these reasons, I hope you found this book interesting, just like I did. And I hope you learned something. Thank you.